Okay, so it's Tuesday morning, your evolution test, um, which also has a little bit of classification stuff on it as well, will be tomorrow. So that will be out from 9 to 11 on Wednesday, June 3rd. Okay, so Wednesday morning, those two hours is when it will be out. Um, classification system stuff, no kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Within that, you also have domains. So domains is the kind of largest grouping. It also gives you the most organisms per grouping. So um, they're not as specific. They're not specific at all. It's the most broad, you should say. Species is going to be your most specific. It's talking about one specific organism. Know your little saying in order. King Philip came over for grape soda, um, good spaghetti, whatever it may be. Binomial nomenclature. Two-part naming system. So genus and species. Genus is capitalized. Species is lowercase. It's either italicized or underlined, and it's always going to be written in Latin. Um, Lamarck, or Lamarck's with evolution. Let's go Linnaeus um, and his classification system. Aristotle was the first one. Linnaeus kind of built upon it. Um, know what a species is. Organisms of the same species are able to interbreed and produce viable offspring that are also able to produce offspring. Um, so from there, we also go on to evolution. This was the concept map that you guys had. I gave you the key of all the little boxes filled in yesterday. Here's some other little things that you guys should be aware of. So evolution means a change over time that we know. With this change over time, there were two ideas of it. There was Darwin's gradualism, where he said there was kind of this accumulation of traits that collected over time, and over thousands of years, you see how things change. Where Elridge and Gould talked a little bit more about punctuated equilibrium. They said there would be a bunch of changes, and then it would stay the same for a very long period of time, and then you would see another change. Um, so two different ideas on how this idea of evolution occurred over time. We know that evolution means... Um, or occurs through the process of natural selection. That was Darwin's idea of evolution. And there were five points that went along with it, and these five points go in order. We talked about how organisms overproduce, because not all of them are going to be able to survive. Since they overproduce, we're going to have this competition. The ones that are the strongest are going to survive, so we have survival of the fittest. Those that survive the best, that have the best traits, are going to reproduce, and eventually over thousands, if not millions of years, maybe they produce a new species there. I'm going to kind of go back this way. Change over time can result in a new species. This idea of evolution was established by Darwin and Lamarck. Lamarck and Darwin were kind of at the same time, however. Remember, Lamarck said the ideas of use and disuse, the more you use something, the stronger it becomes, the more build up becomes. Um, if you don't use a part, it gets smaller and basically disappears. Inheritance of acquired traits. Um, if you pick something up in your lifetime, you pass it on. The giraffes stretched their necks, so the next generation had longer necks. Darwin kind of disproved all of that. So Darwin was a naturalist. He traveled to the Galapagos on the HMS Beagle. He looked at, this should actually say tortoises, not turtles, but you know, you get the idea because he still looked at the shells and the shapes of the shells and the way that they were arranged. Um, and then we also have finches that he looked at. So on those different Galapagos islands, we talked about the different beaks of those particular finches and how they changed. And he said those with the best beaks were adapted to them and they survived best on those particular islands. If we go back a little bit, this idea of evolution is supported by, and these are different uh, evidences of evolution. We talk about um, fossil evidence. I'll start in the middle here, such as whale bones. So any types of bones, fossils, we can actually date them and we can get a little bit idea of how things change over time. We can talk about molecular evidence, such as DNA. So we say, you know, the closer the DNA is, the closer the amino acids are, we can actually compare proteins between them. The more closely related organisms are, the more closely related their amino acid sequences are, which we know comes from their DNA. We can look at anatomical structures, such as vestigial structures, legs on a skink. So you go, oh, well, what's a skink? It's kind of like, um a little salamander sort of deal, but they're saying that maybe they evolved into snakes. Maybe they moved a little faster, not utilizing their legs. Those that had shorter legs survived and eventually they disappear. Kind of like the whales that have the hip bones still. Um, tailbone within humans, appendix within humans. We can also look at homologous structures. So homologous structures mean that we have the same structure but a different function. So that was like the arm of a, a 
cat, um, arm of a gorilla, the wing of a bat, the fin of a whale. They all have the same bone structure, but they're going to be used for a different function. Um, also, we'll come down to this a little bit more, but we also have analogous structures. Same function, different structure. So now we can think of like the wing of a butterfly, wing of a bird, wing of a bat. They're all used for the same function. They're all used to fly, but they're slightly different structures. They're all designed a little bit differently there. If we come back up, let's go to um, types of evolution. So we talked about homologous and analogous, and we can kind of look at types of evolution. So if we think about this idea of divergent evolution, we can look a little bit more at homologous structures, meaning same structure, different function. Organisms are diverging. They're becoming different from one another. So if we look at a whale and we look at a gorilla, yeah, we can say, oh, they got homologous structures. They got the same kind of bone structures within the fin and the front arm, but they use it for different functions. Maybe they evolved from the same organism, but now they're kind of spreading apart. They're diverging from one another. So divergent evolution, we can look at homologous structures. Whereas with convergent evolution, organisms are becoming more similar together. In your notes, you guys had the example of, um, I believe it was like a porpoise and a, sa uh, a seal. So they all have streamlined bodies, and there was also a shark in there. They all have streamlined bodies that they use to go through the water, and because of those streamlined bodies, they look more similar, but they're completely different from one another. So we're saying that they are converging, they're coming close together. So with convergent evolution, we're looking at analogous structures. We added a little bit to your notes, and that was coevolution. So with this idea of coevolution, organisms evolve together. So flowers and bees, or flowers and hummingbirds, as one becomes more brightly colored, maybe one grows a little longer. Well, the hummingbird or the bee has to adapt to it so that it is able to feed off of it. At the same time, if we go through this, uh, let's go over to adaptations with our evolution. With adaptations, we can look at morphological, physiological um, adaptations. We can also look at behavioral adaptations. So what I mean by this, with your morphological adaptations, we talk about organisms that evolved uh, spikes or stingers, or maybe they have mimicry. They look like another organism. They might be brightly colored, but they're really not poisonous like the organism that they have. Um, with physiological, maybe they have certain uh, venoms or poisons that they're able to produce. Maybe they have certain enzymes or hemoglobin that they're able to have. Behavioral, do they have um, a mating dance that they do? Do they have a certain way that they build their homes? Do they come out only at night? So all those ideas are certain types of adaptations. We said that besides natural selection, there's also this idea of artificial selection. And we see this all the time. This is kind of like where we select traits that we want to have. We do this with dogs all the time. So we can be like, oh, I love beagles, but I don't really like the way that they howl. They make that really high-pitched sound. Oh, I really like pugs, but they have these kind of big bulgy eyes that may sometimes have problems with them and a dry eye and stuff. So let's make this puggle. It's a beagle and a pug put together. And it's kind of putting the best traits together there. So artificial selection is where we select the traits that we think are favorable. Besides natural selection, we said that evolution can also occur by chance. And this is kind of the genetics portion of it that we looked at. We said an idea of it is genetic drift. Now, genetic drift will happen usually in small populations because it has to deal with allele frequencies. And a smaller population, we're going to have less of these allele frequencies. So it's easier to lose those particular favorable traits. So, for instance, polydactyl, where you have an extra finger or toe, we see it a lot within the Amish. They marry within their population, they stay within their population, they raise their young within their population. They have a very small gene pool there. Within this idea of genetic drift, we can think about this idea of founder effect and bottleneck effect. And what's happening here is kind of how we're creating these smaller populations. Founder effect, maybe part of that population moves away. So you have a group of 100, and this is that little island Lego scenario that you guys saw video-wise. So founder effect, maybe 10 of them move away. Well, whatever genes in that gene pool are now going to be stuck within that particular island, and we're just going to keep um, cycling them around. Bottleneck effect is a little different. So bottleneck effect, something happens to the population, a tsunami, a hurricane, um, and it wipes out a large portion of it. We can also think of it like this, uh, bugs on a sidewalk and you ride over them with your bike and it's by chance which ones survive and which ones live there. 
but you're breaking down a large chunk of that gene pool. So whatever traits that you have there may be a lot more limited at this particular point. So founder effect and bottleneck effect are both going with this idea of chance and the way that these genes get passed on. The last little bit has to deal with basically how our planet um, evolved. So Miller and Urey, so Miller and Urey are two scientists and what happens is that they said, well, you know, let's look at the idea of how gases were produced and how organisms survived and conditions on the earth. So they went and they kind of simulated the conditions that was found on early earth. They put some carbon monoxide, they put some water, they put some different gases, hydrogens and uh, uh, things like that. And they put them together with a spark, which was supposed to simulate the lightning. And basically they were able to produce amino acids. And they said, oh, okay, so these amino acids can be put together to make proteins. And eventually maybe these proteins made nucleic acids because it was kind of the same materials that are there. So they basically went through and they discovered the conditions found on early Earth. Remember, the gas that wasn't present on Earth when the planet was first forming was oxygen. That comes a little bit later on, and that's why prokaryotes are anaerobic prokaryotic organisms were those first organisms. And their symbiotic theory, they started engulfing one another. They started forming organelles. Um, bacteria that were engulfed formed mitochondria and they form chloroplasts. Well, those chloroplasts that were once bacteria start um, taking sunlight to make food. Now they're making oxygen. So now the oxygen's going to the atmosphere and we're starting to get this oxygen for the atmosphere. So we get that endosymbiotic theory, which is how we form our organelles, chloroplasts and mitochondria, which is basically how our eukaryotic organisms form from there. All right, so that's kind of a little bit of a rundown for you guys, taking all the notes that we have, kind of throwing them together. Don't forget, you also have some stuff on classification in there, but this is the chunk of what you guys have, okay? Let me know if you have any questions, and um, we'll catch up. Thanks, bye.